Okay, we are uh, ready to begin. My name is Dr. Rod Daniels. I'm president of the Institute of the Black World from the 20th century, and we are hosting this oh. event tonight. And it is a historic event, history will record that you are here uh, to witness um, we the next president of the Dunham. Take my word for it. So we got uh, the, the the way this is going to go is we're going to uh, the film is much longer and we need a different version. We need a shorter version for these kind of events. So the film is in its entirety, which is a National Geographic uh, film, it's two hours and 18 minutes. We're, we're going to show an hour after which we're going to have a discussion. It may not be a question. We have to have a mind on the screen and talk about what's going on and it show that how we can be helpful here in the United States of America. But before we begin, we want to first and foremost thank uh, the Metropolitan Amy Church. This is a historic church. This is Frederick Douglass Hall. This is where Frederick <laughs> Church where President Obama, President Clinton, the, this is the So we come here often to see the Black Book for century. Yeah. that for see that. Um, we are always invited to have, be welcomed by Reverend Lee Lamar. He is not a, with us, but to reach you formally is Reverend Cosette Thomas. She is the Catholic pastor here at uh, uh, the historic Metropolitan Miami Church. Would you please welcome her? Good evening, good evening. It is with great pleasure and a sense of profound significance that we are staying for you tonight as we gather for the screening of this film. Not only a powerful documentary, but also a testament to the young people. We've done this one special people. Welcome to this special of our plan that we express it. Please enjoy it. And that's very important. It's very often we have personalities. He isn't even a personality, but he that's why the film was entitled Demand the, the Man the Music. I see some show up. Damn and anger. You know how to bring But it's also about the movement and the organization. So I forgot who you said was about it. So you welcome to going to walk in the hall behind the hall. So uh, this this brother is also with the Pan African Unity Dialogue. And I should have acknowledged the fact that the hearing dialogue is one of the reasons why we are in this position because we meet with this formation every three months to bring African Americans, Caribbean Americans, Afro Latinos, and continental Africans together from the practically stands for where we are. And so it's because of our crisis in Africa task force that we focus on the issue of Uganda for the last at least four or five years um, to stop from Spain. So would you please welcome the editor and publisher of the Black Star News and our host is our Nelson Alamaki. Uh, so brothers, I won't take too much time. Welcome all of you. Welcome to this historic jury post news event. Thank you so much. Dr. Ron Daniels, IBW and PAUD for allowing us to read this year. Um, in South Africa, during apartheid, the masses were paralyzed for a very long time. They thought they were helpless and hopeless. And then a young man, Steve Biko, said, You can liberate yourself by first liberating your mind. And that is how black consciousness started in South Africa. And the youth became empowered. They became less afraid. They started confronting the apartheid regime and the rest was history. In Uganda, a young man stood up. A young man who was known for producing films and music with political content. And he stood up and ran for parliament. 
and he defeated the ruling party's candidate by earning more than two-thirds of the vote. And that young man then campaigned for three other candidates in by-elections, and they all won. And that's when John Seven became afraid, and he started unleashing terror against this young man. And this young man is Robert Tagulani, a.k.a. Bobby Wine. I don't need to say much more because this documentary film will show you how he lifted the consciousness of young people, middle-aged people, and the elderly in Uganda. He liberated their mind. The rest is now history. Uganda will be liberated. And this indeed is not the person that's meant to be the president. He actually won the 2021 election and was denied because Museveni controls the army and refused to yield power. Let's watch the film and let the film tell the story. Thank you, sisters and brothers. Welcome. So therefore, he's the people's president, already elected, just waiting to take, uh, to be inaugurated to take the position. Well, we have a very outstanding panel. Sister Kim, she's here, right? Well, we want you on the front, sister. You can't be sitting back there. This is Sister Kim Poole with the um, Teaching Artists Institute. Yes. And an artist, and a creative person as well. She will be one of our panelists. Um, she hails from Baltimore, but she's global in scope. We've also been joined by our Secretary of State of Black America. That's right, we have a Black Secretary of State. His name is Mel Foote, and he's with the organization to be constituency for Africa. And we also have uh, a sassy, bad, mean, erudite, sophisticated, beautiful sister who happens to be part of this church. Dr. Juliet Malvo, Dr. Malvo, Dr. Malvo, Dr. Malvo, Dr. Malvo, Dr. College for Women, and all that. She was supposed to be on the panel today, but she is enjoying her 70th birthday, no less. Everybody knows a piece of Dr. Julianne Malvo now, so she's not going to be able to hang with us for the whole program, therefore I'm so sorry if you can, but I wanted to come at least make a few remarks. She is a staunch supporter of the Institute of Black World 24th Century, and she was there moderating a session when Bobby Wine electrified the Standard of Black World Conference uh, in Baltimore. <laughs> Dr. Julianne Malvo. Okay, good night, Thank you. Good afternoon, good evening all. First of all, Dr. Daniels, Dr. D, I appreciate you, you know I do. Uh, Father wife, you make my heart sing. I'm going to tell you why. Because I'll be 70 tomorrow. Um, we need you. We need, you know, the average age on the African continent is under 40. That's what we're looking for. Mitt Romney said he ain't running no more. He don't need to. Um, when neither does Biden or Fox Biden or Mitt Just saying. Um, we need to pass the baton and we need y'all to light it up and fire it up and do it up. I'm sorry that I can't be here. I got like five things going on um, this evening. Um, so I apologize for not being on the panel. But what I want to say is that, you know, Dr. D and the Institute of the Black World and Milton and so many others are doing the work. And the way that Mel, of course, doing the work. And the work that we're doing is, first of all, passing the baton, but secondly, lifting these folks up, putting a foundation under the work that they do. Because if we don't have that foundation, we don't have anything. Here's what we know. There is a war going on against our people, not on the African continent or um, in the US, but all over the world. That's some crazy. OK, you know, I try not to curse in church. This is my church. Pastor Lamar told me I can't curse in church. 
So I'm saying some crazy mm, 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 and y'all can fill in the blanks. Uh, this is crazy to go on. But we have to push back because they want to erase our history, erase us, erase what has happened. We can't let it happen. Bottom line, you go do your thing. And we will all be in Uganda. <laughs> Celebrate. I was just you. You are all of you there. You're like, we have to see all the streets. I don't know that. I don't know that. But we all go be there. But more than that, this is about also HR 40, reparations now, the many ways that we say we must have ours. We must have ours. I'm not going to take time. I just want to say thank you, Dr. B. Thank all of you for being here in my church. I joined this church when Vashti McKenzie preached and talked about Frederick Douglass. And I said, you know, I, 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 I'm what I call a spiritual sample. I was raised Catholic. I've been Baptist. I was in the nation for about three days. So I went to Heidelberg, so I got outside. Um, <laughs> But this church resonates with me, and I hope it resonates with you. And I hope we don't just come here for this, but come back, because what we do here is the Lord's work. What we do is minister to the least and the left out. And we raise the issues, and Pastor Lamar has never turned me down, never turned us down to come here. I love y'all. Thank you. Give it up again for Dr. Zuri and Howell. Now, I also um, just want to say um, that's one thing. All right. Yeah, well, you got you got pictures and everything. You, you got to write a book that's uh, showing your visions. We just want to quickly say that there are. Uh, Don Rojas is with us. He is uh, Don Rojas, I got the communications partner. Someone walked in the door and he said, well, he was a veteran reporter from the Washington Post. I didn't know it. The brother said, ain't y'all supposed to start on time? I said, yeah, we try to start on time. But, uh, but whoever that veteran reporter is, wave your hand up. We'd like to have you in the house as well. Right? But they didn't leave already. Anyhow. Uh, but also we have in the house a uh, sister named Peachy Kai Eva is in the house. So we have, the important thing is we have folks in the house who know how to get things done. Right? So now without further ado, we are going to show a substantial portion of this remarkable film. I mean, I was, and I was blessed to be invited to the Diaspora Conference, uh, the National Union Platform, spent a couple of days with them. And uh, by the way, just to read what the mail said, very often when we all gather these days, people say, well, where are the young people? Where are the young people? But in this gathering, we said, where are the old people? Because 85% of the people who were at this gathering were under 40 years of age. At least in my you want to talk to you about guys, if you talk about a new generation doing what my answer says, strong women and men keep coming. They are coming on the African continent, and it is epitomized by the leadership of Bobby White. So let's roll the round.
Thank you. My check, one, two, one, two, my check. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a good evening to you all. I'm very glad to see you, my brothers and sisters from Uganda, those who came from uh, Boston, and all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, every time I watch that film, I get thrilled. Um, this is probably like the tenth time I'm watching it, but every time I watch it, it feels new. Um, yeah, what you saw was just, in my view, the film was just about to start. Um, just after that, we were attacked. That very day um, is when, like Brother Milton was saying, that's when General Seven decided that he could not let that happen anymore. That very day, there was an attempt on my life, and uh, my driver was shot. There was gunshot fired at my car, but my driver fell victim, and he died instantly. I was later on uh, abducted by the military. Um, it took more than 72 hours when nobody knew, knew where I was. I was tortured gravely. Many other people were killed, and that was just the beginning of the crackdown. Since then, many, many of our brothers and sisters have been killed. When I was watching that film, I was watch, I was counting the people that have died. Mm. Many of the people that are in that film are not living anymore. Many were killed, and others were abducted. We've never seen them again, and yet we remain strong, we remain unstopped. I'm just glad that I'm here to speak on their behalf. I'm not here as the hero of the film, because I'm not. The real heroes are those unspoken about, ladies and gentlemen, that you see. The men and women who nobody knows, those that have died, those that paid the ultimate price, and those that are still strong and fighting for better. Um, I'm glad that that film was covered. When I first watched that film, I complained uh, to the producers, and this is what I said to them, why did you have to make General Museveni look so good? Mm. Because in my view, not even 1% of the brutality was covered. Mm. And they explained to me, they told me that if they showed all the medieval kind of torture, maybe the film would disgust people, especially in the West, mm. that are not used to so much brutality. Mm. So they limited the brutality. Mm. However, I'm sure that if you watched it to the end, you would conclude that it was so brutal. And yet, I insist, not even 1% of the brutality was covered in that film. Mm. Like I said, every time I see the international audience watching that film, I feel glad that we are succeeding in making the world understand firsthand what's happening in Uganda. When the producers of that film asked me and my family to open up and let the camera reach anywhere in our lives. I accepted because we wanted to invite the world to Uganda. Many times you read edited stories about Uganda. Uh, we have a very smart president, and I must give it to him, that he has been very smart in covering the atrocities that have happened in Uganda. A rosy picture has been drawn about Uganda, courtesy of Ugandan payers' money. Uh, there are many uh, lobbyist uh, organizations here in America and in Europe that are paid to paint a rosy picture and ensure that none of that uh, brutality goes out in the world. So we are showing this to the world, not because we want you to come and help us. No, but we just want you to help stop sponsoring our death. All that you see happening is courtesy of your taxpayers' money. The United States government gives to the tune of one billion US dollars to General Seveni's government. Every year. In security collaborations and all that. That's exactly what that money does. Uh, unfortunately, you did not see the brutality because it was about to start in the next maybe three, five minutes from where we stopped. But those of you that will be able to see uh, the rest of the film, you'll see what your taxpayers' money is doing. It's 
buying bullets instead of medicines, it's buying tear gas instead of uh, oxygen. It is being used not to fix hospitals or schools, but to bribe uh, those in the opposition and to ensure that you remain under subjugation forever. The people of Uganda, who are largely young people, are being enslaved in their country. We are having modern day slaves in Uganda. Every day, hundreds of young girls are being shipped into the Arab world. Many of them return dead. Many of them have reported of gross violations upon them. In Uganda, we even have businesses of organ trade where somebody is employed but they are actually not employed to work, but their organs are being sold. All that is being happening. We have new colonialists in Black Kings in Africa, and they are being sponsored by the West. So, like I said, we are not here to cry for mercy, but we are here to plead our case and to say that you guys can help stop this. You, the American taxpayers, you at least have the luxury of rights. You are listened to by your leaders. We request you to please reach out to your representatives, your congressmen and women, and ask them to change the policy on Uganda, to stop sponsoring modern day slavery, to stop sponsoring our death. Thank you very much, and I will be glad to share. So we want to um, now have a discussion and have opportunity for questions and answers and so forth. And um, we want to, I want to start with Kim Poo. And I want to start with her, and we want to make sure, where are our mics here? The brothers. Oh, okay, we want to make sure the mic is still functioning. The reason why I want to start with with Kim Poo, not just because she's the youngest person on the panel, because she's an artist. And she believes, uh, as I believe, and many of us believe, in fact, there was an essay done by Ahmed Seka Touré, who talked about culture and revolution. And by the way, if you, those of us who are African Americans, you see the songs and whatever, if you reflect back on the black freedom struggle in the South, what was at the base of it? People were inspired by the freedom songs, the freedom of the SNCC singers and so forth. Culture is a powerful weapon. One of my dear beloved friends, uh, Haki Madabudi, one of his favorite poems is called Art. He talks about the importance of art. So I wanted to start with you, Sister Ken, by talking to us about your reflections on the film uh, when I talk to you, you are already familiar with uh, Bobby Wine, and you are familiar with artists all over the continent who are raising their voices through art. So your reflections on the film, but also your thoughts about the, the power of what you do and the power of art as a part of the Black Liberation Movement. You have the floor. Um, we shall overcome. That's how it makes me feel. Come on, sing along with me. Yes, there it is. We shall overcome. Here 
because she said, I can't be seen. I don't know what will happen when I get back home mm. to Uganda. Young people that work with me every day with the Teaching Artists Institute to say, Kim, how do I tell my story using the music? Because I'm afraid if somebody hears me say something louder than a whisper, that I could be one of those people that I heard about. And so when I hear that film, I think about all the people that weren't there that didn't tell their story, that were afraid to say. And so. I appreciate him saying what wasn't being said, speaking on behalf of the, the speechless. Uh, but they have so much to say in these words, they, they're in their heads and they bounce around their thoughts, they're trapping, they're imprisoning them. And they sleep, so their sleep is disrupted at night. They tell me they're having trouble sleeping, they don't see a future for themselves. They're asking me, when are you gonna help me come to America? Because I think if I can just get out of Uganda, and I'm saying, listen, I'm trying to get to Uganda. <laughs> I'm trying to get a passport. What are you saying? I'm looking right now. Which one of my people, power, partners is going to marry me so I get my Uganda? <laughs> listen, I believe in Uganda. I understand that art and culture is going to be your power. But when I saw this movie, I was disappointed when I watched a judge sit up under a blonde wig making a decision. I said, what is the culture in Uganda? What does African culture in Uganda look like? What does an African attire look like? What does it look like when I sing Ugandan songs? At least he's captured that much. But there's so much more. So really, honestly, the possibility, all those young people, culture is fluid. It continues to change. It's not just promoting and preserving the tradition, traditions of yesterday. It's also imagining what is coming next. Artists help us to define reality. They inspire us, and he's done that. I saw that in the movie, and we're ready to stand beside him, not just artists in Uganda, not just Bobby Wine, but he's the beginning of what will happen across the continent. We're looking at Mali. We're looking at Niger. It's the end of the era, and we have to be prepared. Not because it's not coming, it is coming. We need to be prepared to make sure that we are better than our predecessors. Because like he said, there are new colonizers with black skin that look just like you. When you don't know who's your brother or who's your kinfolk, because inside their mind and inside their heart, they're European. They are the colonizer. And the question becomes, how do we train young people to think with the pan-Africanist mind of Nyerere? How do we change their minds and their hearts? It's the art and it's the culture that's going to connect and reach them. And so we stand here in partnership. All right. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Um, Milton Nalamadi, you have been working on this issue. You are from Uganda, but you're not, you're a Pan-Africanist, and you know in the Pan-African Unity Dialogue, we've been working on this issue. So I wish you would, in your own way, not only reflect on the film, but sort of share with our audience just the utter criminality of Musabeni. And I think one of the things that becomes incredibly important, and it's, Milton and I had this discussion, because I am um, a devotee of Amakal Gabral. And one of the things that Cabral talks about is that we must also struggle against our own weaknesses. And one of the key issues we have is coming out of the Black Liberation Movement, we, it was very easy in Philadelphia when Rizzo, some of you back in the day will know who Rizzo was. He was a vicious white man who was brutalizing black people. Oh, well, we could fight, we were, you know, we were riled up. But when Wilson Good, the black man, dropped the bomb on the move movement, we didn't know what to do. Because there was a black face. But you see, the key question is that we have to understand is we are building this revolution. And some people say, all skin folk ain't kin folk. And we, not, we did not waste the struggle to exchange a, black, a white face, a black face for a white face to, we were not looking for a new oppressor. We were looking for the question of liberation of our people, right? And that's what we, 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 we have to clearly understand. It's like, you know, some of us got a little confused when those black cops beat up and killed the brother in Memphis. Right, right. But you see, it doesn't matter what your skin color is. Mm. If you have the wrong mentality, you will execute on behalf of Europeans, and you will execute in terms of an oppressive mentality. And that's one of the things that we have to change. So, I just want you both to just talk a bit about this, this vicious regime uh, and why it's so important that we gather, you know, in order to support 
Um, not only we're supporting Bobby Wine, but we're supporting more than Bobby Wine. He is the epitome of that which we see in the future. Right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Daniel. Thank you, sister, for that wonderful, uh, inspiring uh, warm-up. <laughs> uh, sister and brothers, Dr. Daniels actually has hit the nail right on the head. Part of the problem has been that we don't want to criticize our own rules because we see that as a betrayal. We should all stand together. But we can't all stand together when some of our own have been the worst betrayers. Who killed Thomas Nagar? Blaze Thompson, who was supposedly his best man, his best friend, an African, a Bukinabe, working in the interests of Western capital that did not like what Sankara was doing. And what was Sankara doing? He said, grow your own food. Why are we dependent? He said, if you want the evidence of imperialism, look at your plate. If your food is imported, that's imperialism. And I think that's the main reason he was really killed. Within three years, they were growing their own food. Food self-sufficiency. Within three years. He said, why are we excluding half of our population from the workforce, the women? Let's not give them token positions. Let's give them meaningful positions in government, in the military. And then he transformed their mindset. He said, everything we need we can produce it ourselves. And that's the kind of message that the West does not like because they want dependent countries in Africa. And in rulers or misrulers like Yano Museveni, they have a very dependable neo-colonial ruler. So if we, we cannot afford to say we can't criticize Museveni because he's a fellow African. No, in fact, in the case of Museveni, it even gets worse. He was once interviewed by a magazine called Atlantic Monthly. And you won't believe what he said, but it's in print, so you can go look it up. September 1994 issue. It's been around so long, it's been around 37 years. That's why I'm pulling back something from 1994. He said, I've never blamed the white man for colonizing Africa. I've never blamed the white man for enslaving Africans. If you were a fool, you should be taken a slave. That is the kind of mindset that they have been supporting to rule an African country, destroy an African country, destroy the hopes of the youth of an African country for 37 years. Look at the contrast. In the Congo, Patrice Lumumba, a nationalist Pan-African, was allowed, even though it was elected democratically, to be in power for three months, from June 1960 to September, overthrown by Mobutu, backed by the CIA and Belgian intelligence, the British intelligence. Mobutu, who replaced him, who destroyed the country, who had him brutally murdered, his body cut up, dissolved in sulfuric acid, if you didn't know, because they didn't even want him to be buried properly, so people could go and celebrate him. Mobutu was maintained in power for 37 years. The same thing we have in Uganda, a reactionary, an anti-African African. I just told you what he said in the magazine. And he practices what he preaches. You only saw a small sample in this film. And Brother Bobby Wine is right. Those were the most sanitized parts of what has been going on in Uganda, supported by US taxpayer dollars. So sister and brother, this is where you come in. If you really want to liberate Africa, we need to get rid of misrulers like Museveni, who has no interest in the welfare of African people. Let me give you a very vivid, vivid example. Women die on a regular basis while delivering children because 
there's no facilities in the hospitals. There was a recent story about a woman who died because she was denied entrance to the hospital. She didn't have the money to pay. When the dictator's own daughter was about to deliver, she got on the $50 million Gulfstream debt that he bought with public funds, sent her to Germany to deliver the baby, his grandkid, and then fly back to Uganda. That's the type of anti-African African we have ruling Uganda. We need to get rid of those kind of leaders and let the best of Africa emerge. And Bobby Wine is one example of the best in Africa. And we have it in many other Africans. So you can help us with our struggle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Brother Melton. And now I'd like to turn to um, Mel Foote. Mel Foote has been, he, he's a quiet brother. Um, he tries to play, you know, like quiet and stumbles around like he don't know where and all that kind of stuff. That's calculated because he's a bad brother. And he has been dedicated for, for decades to building relationships on the continent, building a constituency in the United States for Africa. Uh, there are so many things we could say about him. The African Growth and Opportunity Act, he virtually wrote it and brought it into existence. The Africa, Africa Summit didn't turn out as maybe the way we all wanted to, but he is one of the ones who helped to put it on the table and is constantly pushing on it. I get emails from him all the time. He's on the watch, working with key leaders, working on Africa policy. One of the proudest moments I have is that our dear beloved sister, who is the UN ambassador for the Biden administration, is a close friend and confidant of Mel Foote. And I have a photograph with our UN ambassador. So Mel, I'd like you, I know you're nonpartisan and you don't endorse candidates and things of that nature. But the issue becomes the trend on the African continent and your feelings about that given how much time you invest. There have been how many, five coups or six coups in the last uh, almost six months or so, I mean, whatever we have. So, so contextualize what you're seeing in Uganda in terms of the movement and what you see around the continent and, and how does that fit in terms of, uh, uh, how, what you see in terms of the future? Well, thank you very much, Ron, uh, Bobby. Uh, first, let me say the movie, you know. Uh, I thought the movie was powerful. Where's the rest of it, you know? Uh, I thought it was, it was powerful, it was well done. I thought it was honest, you know? Um, and so that needs to be seen broadly uh, by people. I thought it was excellent. So uh, I really love the part where you met your wife and yes, uh, you know she didn't know who, who Bobby was. You know? yeah, I mean, she's like, is that possible? Well, well that's how I love work. Uh, but I thought it was it was very congratulations on the movie. Uh, it was exceptional. I got to see the rest of it. Um, I Africa. I've, uh, you know, my, my whole career has been Africa, almost 50 years now. I uh, started out as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ethiopia and Eritrea. I spent several years in Somalia, I spent several years in Sudan. Um, so when they say an African American, you know, I love Africa and I love America, you know, and I try to operate in that paradigm. Um, I think. Uh, uh, you know, the United States, quite frankly, is uneducated, undereducated, and miseducated about Africa, period. Uh, if you go outside of the Beltway here and you say uh, you're from Uganda, they would not even know where you're talking about, you know. Uh, how many countries in Africa, they wouldn't have a clue, you know. Uh, tell me something about Mussolini, they wouldn't have a clue. And this doesn't matter if there's black Americans, white Americans, Hispanic Americans, we just don't know much about Africa. And one of the things I tried to uh, press on, and I pressed on with Ambassador Carson last week, we had him for dinner. And um, I asked him, how are we going to correct this distortion? You know, you're talking about you want to invest $50 billion in Africa or something like that. Well, how are you going to tell this to the Trump people? 
mm. who think that every dollar we spend in Africa is taking something out of my pocket. Mm. But yet we'll spend that money on Ukraine at the drop of a hat. Mm. Um, and so, uh, you know, for me, uh, my mother always told me growing up, don't agonize, because I would come home from school all mad about stuff. Don't agonize, organize. You know? right, right. Don't just get mad, do something about it, you know? And so what I try to uh, do with my work is I try to structure stuff that change uh, the paradigm. And uh, whether it's trade, whether it's the HIV AIDS, uh, uh, President Obama, I got him to do the Young African Leaders Initiative. I told him, don't spend your time on Mugabe and Bia and Bashir and Mutsavini. Spend your time with the young ones coming up, the yeah. next generation. Because I think it's about change. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, I met President Museveni uh, back in 94 in Kampala. And uh, this was during the time of a Goa. And I turned around and, you know, 25 years later, he's still in power. You know, and acting like he don't want to go nowhere. And I asked myself, sometimes, is there a God out here? Doesn't God have something to say about this? But, uh, you know, uh, we as a constituency, uh, we as a people have got to get better organized to, uh, you know, to change things. Uh, I'm an example that you can change the U.S. policy if you can get focused, if you can actually uh, press on them and make sure that they're interested in what you're talking about. And that's a real critical ground. You do a superb job of that, and you've done it for 50 years or more. And, uh, Ron is probably the smartest black man I know. You know? <laughs> and uh, really, I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke, but he's been doing this for so long and uh, constantly present. He's the nicest human being on the planet. But you know, sometimes you get stuff done with black people, you gotta be a tyrant. Mm. You know, you gotta be mean and angry, you gotta act like Mussolini. <laughs> but uh, I think, uh, I think uh, the, the change is gonna come, you know? Uh, you know, I think that young people, and when I look at people who are in their 40s, come on, this is going to be your world whether I like it or not. Whether Ron likes it or not, this is going to be your world, you know. And uh, Africa has a lot of work to do. A big part of this problem is that Africa is not unified, you know. Uh, Africans never were a unified place. It was about tribes and ethnic groups and clubs and whatnot, you know. The Europeans came and drew boundaries and so you want to go see your brother, you need a passport. Mm. Um, you know, this is not an African thing. So Africa is trying to get itself unified. I think it has a long way to go before that happens. I think that African Americans also are trying to connect with Africa. But what they've done through up through slavery and through this process, took away our names, took away our culture. You know, uh, we're looking at each other, don't know who we are or what we are. So I think Julia Malvo hit the nail right on the head. You know, this is not just a problem in Africa. This is a problem with the African world. So I, uh, I'm honored to, to be here. Anything I can do to push the agenda, I'm going to do it, you know. Uh, and uh, Ron and I will talk with them, see what we can do that actually makes them. But you can actually get the policy makers. They don't buy this. Most of these people in Congress, a lot of people think because you're in Congress, that means you must be smart. Mm. Well, I've seen some of the dumbest people I've ever met in this country uh, sitting up there on the hill. Don't know SHIT from Shinola. You know, I ain't supposed to cuss up here. And yet they're sitting there because they somehow rank on a seat in Congress. Uh, and so what I found is that you've got to work on staffers. Mm -hmm. You've got to work on twisting it so that the, the, the member of Congress can be seen as a leader. If we had a member of Congress here today and they saw this film and saw us sitting here, you would have believed that they would have switched their whole thing talking about, yeah, we gotta move this agenda and, and, and you know. So you gotta you gotta you gotta psychologically work on members of Congress. Who's our member of Congress who is taking the lead on this? I don't know who it is. Uh, so we gotta work on some of these things. But I'm I'm excited to be here. I learned a great deal just uh, in watching the, the film. I've met Bobby on several occasions now. But it, the, the film did something else. It kind of uh, educated you about the reality of the situation in Uganda. So I'm here, and I'm very supportive of, of what we're trying to do, and Ron knows how to reach me, and so we're going to pull this in. Thank you very much. People have. All right, all right.
Well, we've got, to, we've got to take some questions and or comments from the audience now. And I just want to say a couple of other things. I, I miss uh, one of our great leaders in black America and globally, one of the great thought leaders, particularly on the issue of reparations, but much more. Uh, back, we got three different things happening <coughs> coming up. You know, we're doing this event tonight and we've got a special thing on Haiti coming up on Saturday. Um, but on tomorrow, we'll be talking about H.R. 40. Uh, the bill, not only to study, but the bill to study and develop reparations proposals for African Americans. So I reference our dear beloved sister, Nkichi Taifa, who's been on reparations forever and done a great job with it. And also, Rug House. I mean, she has done so much in so many different areas. But we also have in the audience Cam Howard who is uh, the executive director of Reparations United, former, former co-chair of the co-chair. So now what I want to do now, and by the way, uh, I had a very interesting, I'm always, whenever I'm in the Ubers and so forth, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out the accents and that, talking to people, and it's very interesting. That's one of the, uh, I bumped into somebody who knew Kim Poo in, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, when I was on the Uber. I had two Ethiopians today, so I was talking about the crisis in Ethiopia. And then yesterday, I was with a brother. I think he's still in the audience. I, you know, I want him to raise his hand. He may have, have, have eased out already. And um, so he was like on fire because he's trying to engage building these bridges of economic opportunity among African Americans and, uh, and Africans. And he was talking about Sierra Leone. I told him I know Ambassador Sadiq Y. But also, Raleigh Kimbrough is in the audience. And Raleigh Kimbrough is a global entrepreneur. He's going to work all over. Raleigh is still in the room. Anyway, Raleigh is a member of this church, and he does great work. But uh, is it Brother Thomas? Brother Thomas, are you still in the audience? I think he may have just left. But anyway, he was in the Uber. And I said, Brother, what are you doing? What's your, uh, I said, is this your main gig? And he said, well, no, I'm just buying time. I'm, I'm, I'm investing in Africa. So I definitely want to connect him because there's people like that that we really want to connect because his mind is in the right place, you know, and so we want to make those kind of connections as well. So what we want to do now is um, uh, I'll grab the mic and, and uh, scoot around the audience. If there are people who have comments, people who have questions, and I want to tell you in advance what my ass is going to be because tell no lies, claim no easy victories. We expected this place to be packed tonight. So I'm disappointed that we don't have a larger audience tonight. But that does not deter me at all, because I know, having seen this, that all of you are going to join with us, because we're going to do another screening, right? And we're going to put, it, put our heads together, and we're going to organize, and because people need to see this film. They need to see it. Right? They need to see it. And so we're going to organize, and I'm relentless in that regard. I come time and time again. So I, I'm gonna grab my mic, I see Sister Taifa, but I saw my brother here first, so I'm gonna scoot around. And uh, Milton, you kind of keep the stack for me, okay? By that I mean who's first or whatever. Yes, sir. Okay. Hello, my name is Brother Che, and uh, the scripture says, call those things that be not as though they were. So I'll address you as Mr. President. Father, welcome. Uh, I saw that film probably a couple years ago on uh, PBS, but it's a fascinating film, and that's what introduced me to President Wine. And I just say it's an honor to just meet you and to just be here in the same space as you. I, I also want to say that we should be careful with the language of the oppressor. Now I heard them heard the word coup mentioned earlier today, tonight, but you never heard of the American coup, you heard of the American Revolution. The difference between a coup and a revolution is when the French or the Americans, like what Mobutu did, take out a great man for your personal gain and for your oppressor. What these young brothers are doing in Niger, in Guinea, and they are taking 
sit down evil men that worked for Europe, for the people, and their mind and their hearts are for the people like yours is. And that's why I love you, and I wish you all the best. Okay, we're following along with the brother. Greetings, Brother President Wine. Uh, I first met you at the State of the Black World uh, several months ago in uh, Baltimore. And seeing just the little bit of the film that we saw today, and then hearing from you as to what was coming next in the film, I'm really frightened. I'm going to be very honest. And I don't want to know any particulars or anything along those lines. But I just want to make sure that you have things in place for your personal security. Okay. Visible or invisible or whatever. Just want to make sure that that is there so that when the fruition period comes, for you actually to be able to actualize uh, 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 that position as, as president, that you will be able to do so. And so I, I just wanted to... I just want to say that because we love Elmer and respect you. Okay? And we need you to continue doing what you need to be doing without falling victim to what so many others about young revolutionaries who have aspired to, um, you, you know. So I'm just going to end it at that. Thank you. Thank you. So let me also continue as Mr. President. Well, so we're going to claim that tonight in, in hit right here in D.C. that we're in the presence of the next president of Uganda. Um, I also had the pleasure of meeting you in Baltimore at the State of Black Union address. And uh, you, you talked about the brutality and atrocities that we didn't see in the film. And that it's up to us to be able to deliver this message to political leaders and to the American public that this is what their taxpayer dollars are funding. I know that the Africa Summit Biden committed certain a number of billions of dollars not only for aid but also for security purposes in Africa, which means propping up these illegal military governments like Uganda, that's in Uganda. We need to, in our effort to work on behalf of the youth of Uganda, of Uganda the, the people of, of Uganda, a document, a fact sheet that identifies and details the, 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 the atrocities in writing that we can use as we go and interact and lead with these political leaders. And so they will say, we, so we can say, you have the proof right here. It's not just what we're, what we're telling them. And so I think that is something that we need in order to move forward in our mission to help Africa rise. Well, thank you very much. Let me just say, uh, I'm coming over here. Uh, just uh, FYI, we, we did have um, uh, a meeting, uh, Mel, uh, with um, the person, uh, Congressman Meeks wanted to meet with Bobby Wine. He, he was trying to, you know how it is, how difficult it is. But Congressman Meeks is the Congressional Black Caucus member who was the ranking, was, was the chair of the House uh, Foreign Relations Committee. That is the powerful committee that deals with these global issues. He's now the ranking member, and he's on it. He is supportive of it. He's a dear friend of mine. I can pick up the phone and call him, and I have, and talk to him about this issue. And the person who is in, who, who, who is in charge of dealing with these questions at the staff level, and you know how that works, we spent an hour and a half today with that person. And I must say, it was a very productive meeting. And there is a document uh, that begins to do this. And Milton, you've done these fact sheets before. So we are going to do, Cam, exactly what you said. We're going to produce a fact sheet so that we have all the, and, and then basically two pages or whatever. Uh, we'll have that information. Our Commandante, Don Rojas, who is with the uh, Director of Communication and Information for uh, and International Relations for IBW is here, and we will we'll make sure we put post it on the website and we will share it around so that because a part of this, this is just the beginning, we'll come back here, but we have made a, a commitment to go to CAM, and you can help us 
when we, we co-host them in Chicago. And we will go to Rainbow Push with Reverend Jesse Jackson and, and, and meet there. We'll be going you know, to the National Action Network in New York. We are going to build a powerful movement in this country for the new president. We're Panelists, thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, special thank you, uh, President Bobby Wan. Uh, this is more of a question. When I think of your campaign and movement, it, um, it reminds me of Robert Nestemani, Bob Marley. And I think what uh, your campaign and movement represents at the intersection of music, excuse me, particularly African music and activism, is something huge. What uh, advice or what comments would you have for anybody wanting to break into the music industry and not have capitalism be the, uh, the wind behind that pen? What advice would you have for folks? Um, Oh, well, well, I tell you, if you, you, you take the questions, you can respond at the end if you choose, all right? Let's go over there. Oh, you. Certainly, thank you, uh, your pre Mr. President there. Uh, Brother Haki Ali, President of Teaching Artists Institute. Um, I have a question in terms of uh, human rights violations. Uh, the African Union have a, what is it, the African Justice uh, Office in Arusha. Uh, have you ever, or do you feel that President Museveni's, uh, uh, well, I'm sure you do, feel like that his crimes have reached the level to take that uh, to the African Union in Arusha uh, to get support or awareness? And have you or uh, pushed that uh, to get it recognized? Or if anybody else on the panel can uh, speak to that. Okay, we're going to answer that. Let me see. Sister over there. Oh. Sister, she's a culture worker too. She's been at our State of the Black World Conferences recommended by Nkichi Taiba, yes. That's right. Blessings, everyone. Uh, my name is Nana Malaya, and I'm also known as the Dancing Diplomat. Um, I am an artist, an activist, and an educator, and I wanted to actually mention to all of you um, on the panel, and I agree we're going to claim you as president already. Um, I became familiar with Uganda through the culture and the arts. And um, back as long ago now, 95, I worked with a group and I studied the Bakisimba and quite a number of other dances and traditions of Uganda. Yeah. And I mention that because getting a chance to meet all of you here, and I also want to encourage you, because you may mention, Ron, of the culture, that even an event like this, which is primarily, I heard it as being political, but I know sometimes to get people's ear and eye, you need to uh, bring them some of the culture. And having people singing and dancing, sometimes it's thought to be frivolous, but it's the culture. Sometimes it's the flower that gets people to see the root. And so I just want to, any way that I can assist you all in um, being that cultural ambassador, you know, uh, in ways in which I'm working with others here as well, because um, that's one of the ways to get people to pay attention to what's going on. Some people will hear that first, see that first, and then they'll be able to listen and hear each of you in terms of what you have. But it's also a way for people to get to know the people and the culture, because as we were talking about, in the United States, very few people know how many countries there are on the continent, the names, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to bridge that gap, and I'd like to help um, bridge that gap as well. So nice to meet you all. And let me also just thank WPFW. Um, I do know that WPFW was running the PSAs now, so a lot of people heard about it. And there are some conflicting events tonight, too, because I know that the Rainbow Push has a big diaspora program tonight that they're having at the same time. Some of those folks would have been here as well. And then the Congressional Black Caucus is very active and whatnot. But we do want to thank WPFW. Let's give it up for WPFW. Right. We have some 
support WPFW. They've been a strong support of the work that we do over and over again. Uh, any more comments or, okay, let's go here and here. So, you're first. Um, President Bobby Wine, it's truly an honor. Um, I feel like I'm uh, standing in front of Toussaint Overture. Uh, it's really rare to get to it's rare to get to meet somebody who's truly great, like you are. Um, now I don't say that um, trivially. I think all of us saw in the film what you're standing up against, the risk you're taking to yourself to do that, and how much you mean to, to the people of Uganda. So uh, I just want to say I admire you so much. I think that we all do. So thank you for, for being here, Grace and Austin, with your, with your presence. Um, my question is, what does Pan-Africanism mean to you? Um, and how do you build coalition with other like-minded political activists around the continent? Uh, Julius Malema comes to mind as somebody who appears to be um, somebody on the same wavelength as you um, and anyone else who, who comes to mind for you. Thank you. Hey, now we got to sign up some of these young brothers here. We got some people, we got some Africans rising up in here. You know, yeah, I like that. I like what I'm hearing. Uh, yes, my sister. Hi, my name is Florence. I'm actually from Uganda, so of course I know all these things that have been happening in Uganda over the last, you know, several years, and many of us have been, you know, traumatized with events in Uganda. Uh, how can we get this film uh, screened in Congress and in the Senate? How do we get the people in Congress and Senate to watch this film? And how do we get this film on the major networks so that the people of America can, can see it? And uh, one more thing, how do we get, what steps can we take to get the government of the US to cut off that one billion um, dollars that they're sending to the regime in Uganda every year, uh, perhaps brother, Melvin will have some tips on things we can do. I know we've protested in the, in, at the UN in New York. There have been several pro protests in, at the World Bank all over the place over the last seven plus years, but we don't seem to have made any headway. How do we get the US government to actually listen to us and to make this a priority? Thank you. All right, let me just say that uh, we're working on the film question. In fact, um, um, Mel and um, we'll put that down. We talked about that today in our meeting. So we're not going to be able to get them. That's why, though they cut it a little short. I mean, we have to. We really need Bobby Wine's people to to have something to say about what goes into the reduced version because it, it cut off too much. You know, we need to get a mix of all the different uh, aspects of it. But I think we will be able to get some congresspersons, but certainly staffers, in a luncheon or a meeting in which we do an airing of it and, and have that kind of, I think we can actually make uh, that happen. So we're now going to go to our president for him to respond. Yes. Yeah, I mean, he'll, he'll, he'll I mean, they, I'm sure he'll share, because I know it's going to air, it's going in theaters and so forth. So. It's now turn for him to uh, to respond. If you want to stand, you can. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I feel uh, honored by the reception, and uh, I take the honor and I report back to the people of Uganda that indeed, in America, people refer to me exactly how the people mean <laughs> okay. I must also uh, mention that it was not, and it, it is not an end in itself, just me being president, because it's not about me being president. Even if I don't become president, we just want to be free. We just want to see that freedom in our lifetime. I was only four years when General Museveni took power in 1986. I'm almost a grandfather now. <laughs> so we, we, we just want to see that freedom in our lifetime, regardless of whether or not I become president. I think it's 
very important to make it clear that our aspiration is to be free. And I'm just leading the charge right now. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to be at the front of it, but we just want to be free in our lifetime. And we will be free. We shall be. Uh, quite a number of questions, but I'll start with a music question. Um, well, uh, let me start from top. Uh, my sister asked a very deep question. Um, I think it was a comment about my personal security. And now I can guarantee it. I regret to inform you that I can't guarantee it. I don't know what's going to happen. That's why I live every day as if it's my life. As if that, that's all that there is. I, I just want to make sure that for as long as I live, I create enough damage to the forces of oppression. It did not start with me. So many people have been in this struggle. Many of them have gotten worn out. Many of them have gone. But now we are here. And we strongly believe that we are the generation to fulfill the promise. Um, I can't guarantee my security, but the last time I was close to getting killed was when I was abducted by the military. I spent three days when nobody knew where I was, but internationally, people that I knew and many people that I didn't know raised their voices. They protested, they made noise, and the regime was pressured and released me. So I want to say that just like I owe my life to the protests that happened all over the world, still I'm still at the mercy of those international voices. So please kindly keep your attention on Uganda. And uh, whenever you see that I or anybody else has disappeared, your voices are the life-changing voices. We depend on them greatly, greatly. I must also inform you that I'm going back to Uganda next week. Yeah. I don't know what to expect, but I'll be alive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, my brother also asked us to come up with a fact sheet about Uganda, and uh, I agree. I'm very honored to be working alongside my able elder brothers like uh, Professor Limadi here. Uh, we have a leadership, a chapter here. Uh, I will ask them to take that upon themselves to see that those facts are put together and are spread as uh, far wide as possible. Now, um, brother asked me about the music. Uh, what advice do I give to an artist? who wants to make it, but not on the basis of Western capitalism or the bling bling or, or, or that. I'll first say music is super, super effective. I'm standing here not because I'm the most educated or I'm the most knowledgeable. As a matter of fact, I come from that generation that was mentally sterile for a very long time. We, we didn't care about... <laughs> what happened in our society personally and i'll tell you a very quick story um in my early 20s i mean i was like any other excited artist i grew up with my mother my father my family lost all their wealth when the seven is coming to power so when i was growing up my mother warned me and all my siblings to keep out of politics because that was the reason why we ended up in the ghetto in the first place. So I worked so hard, became a super famous artist. I drove the first Cadillac Escalade in town with 24 inch spinning wheels, and I was accomplished. <laughs> Until this one fateful day when I was walking in waves and moving out of a nightclub, when a young man my age walked up to me because all the girls had their eyes on me. And he felt like I was stealing the show from him. So he walked up to me and slapped me. Before I turned to fight back, he pulled a gun and put it on my face, slapped me some more. I said, yo, why are you showing off? Don't you know this country has owners? 
that's when I realized that you know my fame and fortune did help when I still oppressed. Mm. And using my fame and the effectiveness of my music, I changed and became edutainment instead of entertainment. I started mm. addressing the issues that many people had been facing, but I was, you know, covered from or so I thought. So I realized the importance of my music and since then my music even got deeper in the hearts of the people because I was singing about their predicament, I was singing about their situation. Music is very important. No wonder my music is now banned in Uganda. Mm -hmm. My name is banned in Uganda. My music cannot play on TV mm -hmm. or on radio and if you're caught playing my music, you risk your life. But guess what? My music is still the most popular music in Uganda. Mm -hmm. so, Music is powerful. Now to answer your question, what's my advice to an artist that wants to rise up back from the depth of his soul? I will say, stay real. Keep real and keep true. Because when you sing the truth, actually that's when you get the real fans. Those that identify with you, they might come slow, but every fan that you get will be an added fan forever. You will grow with those people, have been able to grow with those fans. We breathe the same air even before we meet because we are looking at something bigger than ourselves. This music is just an element that brings us together. So sticking to what's right, speaking the truth and representing the truth and the reality, in my view, and in my experience as an artist, is unbeatable. Um, I, I don't know if that was the question, but I thought this I understood it. Uh, it's as if uh, you were asking whether we have sought any redress from any court. Was that the question? Yes, uh, in Uganda, General Museveni is a god, for lack of a better word. He has the parliament in his pocket. He has the courts of law in his pocket. He is the law, he is the law and the law is him. His son will make a, pronouncing, a pronouncement, no matter how illegal it is, and it will be taken by the courts and by all people. So we don't expect any justice in Uganda. However, we went ahead and we petitioned the International Criminal Court. We put a case against General Seveni in the International Criminal Court, and this follows the massacre that happened on the 18th and 19th of November 2020, where more than 150 of our supporters, including men, women, and children, even old people that were gunned down by the military, on camera, it was covered by BBC, by CNN, by Al Jazeera. We took him to the International Criminal Court. We hope that the International Criminal Court will do the right thing, but we just want to make sure that we tick every legal box across the globe. So we took General Seveni to the International Criminal Court. We also hope to bring another um, case in the East African Court of Justice, but we also know that you know we are dealing with an extremely empowered and uh, you know a regime that has been in power for 37 years we only do the right thing and we hope these institutions will also do the right thing that is how far we can go internationally locally we are galvanizing our people to resist to continue resisting even under tough tough conditions um, my brother asked, what does, um, what does Pan-Africanism mean to me or to us? Um, Pan-Africanism, as far as I know, is the rooting for or the desire to uplift African people or people of African descent all over the world. So to us by our forefathers, the likes of Kwame Nkrumah, uh, the likes of Nyerere, and many other 
our forefathers and mothers that came before us. And that's what we know, what is supposed to be done. Unfortunately, there's a different version of Pan-Africanism by the African leaders, majority of them. In fact, it's not only a redefinition of Pan-Africanism, it's also a redefinition of these continental and regional blocks, the East African community, the African Union, and all that. I'm afraid to note painfully that the East African community and the African Union have been reduced to president's clubs to look out for each other against their people, but not against, not for the African people. You'll notice that it's the African people that suffer most in Africa. It is harder for an African man, for a black man like me, to cross from one African country to another. And it's much easier for a white man. It is more dangerous for an African man like myself to live in an African country called South Africa because of the xenophobia where we Africans are seen as intruders, but you know, the Europeans are saluted and have the red carpet rolled out for them. It is more painful for a black Ugandan man to do business in Uganda than a Chinese or Indian man or woman. That's the kind of Pan-African Pan-Africanism that our our leaders are showing us. I mean, recently when we had the COVID pandemic and we had our black and black uh, brothers and, and sisters in countries like China segregated and blocked from housing. Um, I dealt with uh, some African brothers here in the US and we were able to charter a plane to fly them back, but no African government would allow us to land, including Uganda. You know, so that's the kind of Pan-Africanism that we are having. We are being mortgaged. You know, what is African to the leaders of Africa, majority of the leaders, is the resources, not the people. So, according to me, I believe that Pan-Africanism should be the upliftment of the African people, not African leaders. Yes. You know, it should be about the people. And uh, not only Pan-Africanism, but even the regional and continental blocks, they should be about the people, bringing the people together and looking out for the people, the populations, and not the leaders. Unfortunately, it is the leaders and not the people. We, the people, are seen as let me reserve that. Um, we, we, we were also asked uh, by my sister, how do we get the congressmen and women to watch this film? I don't know. I don't know. We're trying as much as possible. Um, this morning, I flew from LA to here because there was an opportunity to speak to this crowd, however small it is, and we make every effort to ensure that anybody, not only the congressmen and women, but you, the voters, to make sure that you see this, because if you see this film, maybe you'll make an effort to see that another person sees it, and you'll have reason when something happens in Uganda or in any, any other country in Africa to raise your voice. And I must say that Uganda is just a case study, ladies and gentlemen. Do not reduce this only to Uganda. We are only a case study. And because maybe I'm a popular artist and there's that aura of cameras that come to me, but just recently in Zimbabwe, there was an election. And what happened in Uganda exactly happened in Zimbabwe. Unfortunately, they don't have the opportunity that I have. We have our brothers in Eritrea. We have our brothers in many other parts of Africa. The same pain that we go through. So I hope what I'm saying here is not only representative of the people in Uganda alone, but all marginalized people in Africa and all the black world all over the world and also other marginalized places like in South America, 
and many other places. I hope my words represent them because it will be very selfish for me to limit this flight to only Uganda. Our people are suffering all over the world. And finally, uh, the same sister asked, how do we get the U.S. government to listen? Well, the U.S. government will listen to you if you pressure it. Some Jamaican singer said, if you don't stand up, nobody's going to see you. If you don't yell, nobody's going to hear you. So, speak up. And speak up some more. When they don't listen, don't stop. Even when they listen, don't stop. Thank you. All right. And so, as um, I told you, you, you are witnessing the next president of the president to assume his position. And I want to close, uh, and we're going to find an inspirational way of closing. I don't know whether we will uh, whether they, you were, you were uh, in the film, they were asking you to do uh, <laughs> improvise a, a quick one, and then you got Sister Kim over there. I don't know what, we might have to figure out how we're going to knock it out at the end. So, but I do on a very sober note want to say the following things. Number one, it's not hard, it's not easy to be a revolutionary and maintain a family. It's very difficult. During the course of the black freedom struggle in the 60s and 70s, that was one of the key questions. A lot of families got split up because it was just, it was just hard, the pressure, if you will. And so, and I, and, I, and I say this with all humility, but I have been on this struggle for many, many years. Uh, I'm just 81 years old now, going towards 82. I was one of the founders of African Liberation Day. And some of you were here in 1972, Sister Nkishi, you now you know, you were here. We put 35,000 people in the streets here in Washington, D.C., 10,000 in Canada. Oakland, California, another 10,000. The New Jewel Movement, this man here was the press secretary for Maurice Bishop, right here. So the we did that because we were committed to the liberation of Africa. We were young Pan-Africanists fighting for the liberation of Africa. And I shall never forget the reason why we did that was because we went to the AO, uh, OAU and we had an experience in which we were chastised appropriately because we, you know, we were in there hot stuff and you know and whatever. And they say, well, what is this Pan-Africanism? We don't see you doing that, frankly. And we took up that challenge. But because we did, there were so many movements that sprang out of African Liberation Day, the Free South Africa movement, led by people like Randall Robinson and and, 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 and others who, who went to the South African emb embassy, Congressman Fontroy and uh, our sister with the, uh, help me out with the um, um, commission, uh, thinking Mary, Mary, Mary uh, Francis Berry and others. So we have some skin in the game. I, I am an ardent Pan-Africanist, but let me just also address your question. There is Pan Africa, even when Pan Africanism was conceived, there was a struggle around it. Because there were some people who just wanted it to be cosmetic. All black people coming together. But we now know that that is not enough. There was a split between uh, those who were the so called Monrovia group, Liberia and, and Ethiopia with the Haile Selassie. They, they, they wanted Pan Africanism. But they did not want a Pan-Africanism that was really going to be for the people. They were nervous. In fact, they put into the OAU charter the non-intervention into the affairs of another country because they did not want anybody to mess with the fact that they were in power. Mm -hmm. But you then had the Casablanca group. That's where Nairi and, and, and Jacob Touré and Kwame Touré, they were in that group. And then Krumah. So what we're talking about is progressive Pan-Africanism. 
Progressive Pan-Africanism is exactly what Bobby Wine talked about. It is a Pan-Africanism that is about the total transformation of African people, the liberation of the African mind, and the capturing and the utilization of African resources for the development of African people. That's what it's about. In our own spare, we have too many handkerchief head African leaders who are self-aggrandizing. They're giving the resources of Africa away, and they are parking their, their money. I mean, Mobutu had, what, three or five, about $500 million parked yeah, somewhere? Most of Randy probably got a billion dollars. I mean, come on. So we're talking about progressive Pan-Africanism. The other thing I want to say is that it was that family, your family, but the way in which you see yourself, it's a, it's a partnership, working together. And by the way, this is about, I do mean partnership, because we also have to address in our own communities very often the question of, 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 of patriarchy and paternalism, where women are relegated to being in a second place position. We cannot have that. Not in the new African world. We have to have partnership the other thing I want to say, if you want to talk about, yeah, he, there is no guarantee. We cannot guarantee, and he is in danger. I'm a prayerful man. I pray for this brother. I tell my talk to the village, I say, oh my God, look what he just said. I said you know, I, but the best way to protect him is to build a powerful international movement. Because you don't dare touch my Hands off Bobby Ryan. And from our president. That's how we do it. Because then the international community will think twice. And not only that, the real deal here is not only does he have to be concerned about the, the European imperialists, he also has to be concerned about these leaders who see him as a threat. Because if, in fact, Museveni goes, yes. they know that in their home, their own communities, their people are rising up to challenge them as well. Yes. So they are also plotting and scheming and trembling. Yes. And they need to tremble. Because they need to go. They need to get out of the way. So the back of the So our takeaway is we are going to move on a number of different issues. I'm glad my brother's passing around the, the, the sheet. He's got a good organizer. He's been well trained because mm -hmm. we didn't think about that, but we get a copy of it because we're going to be calling on people because there are a number of things that we will be working on to build this movement. So I want to, in fact, thank you all profoundly for coming out because you could have been doing many, many other things. And to me, I never ever really worry about how many people come. I really don't. Because we don't know who's in this room. Now, who will be the next person who takes this message and turns in a very dynamic way in order to, to, to tip the scale? So I'm a Christian, so you know, Jesus the Christ was, he only had 12, but the 12 became the multitude. You saw in this film a person who had the guts and the courage to stand for, forward fearlessly. And when you see these images of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of young people, Two weeks ago. it says that when you have the courage and the vision, then people will follow. So I'm not deterred. We're going we're gonna to move forward. We're going to build on this. We're going to help bring Bobby Wild across the country. We're going to be interfacing with the congressional government. Faithful we're going to build a powerful movement in this country. So we're not going to close with that. We're going to close on a high note. We're either going to do a harambe. If we don't do a harambe, we're going to do a freedom song. But we're going to say amen collectively as an African people. And we're going to ask Bobby Wine and Kim Poole to step up here and figure out how they're going to dismiss us. You have the call. Come on. Thank you, thank you very much. I must recognize uh, the presence of our oh, local yes, leader, the leader of our chapter, Dr. Daniel Karama. Thank you very much for the leadership. In our absence, he answers all the questions. Um, I'll teach you two things. First, I'll teach you our slogan. When you say people power, you say our power. When I say our power, 
You say people power. Okay, let's do it. People power. Our power. Our power. People power. People power. Our power. Our power. People power. Thank you. And then there's a song that we sing. Uh, we get it from a hymn. We sing these words not just because we enjoy them. We sing them because we believe them. The song goes, uh, when the struggle is over, we shall wear the victor's crown. We shall wear the victor's crown. We shall wear the victor's crown. When the struggle is over, we shall wear the victor's crown in the new Uganda. So, so this is how it goes. When the struggle is over, we shall wear the victor's crown. We shall wear the victor's crown. We shall wear the victor's crown. When the struggle is over, we shall wear the victor's crown. In a new Uganda. Come on, on our feet. Let's do this again. When the struggle is over, we shall wear the victor's crown. We shall wear the victor's crown. We shall wear the victor's crown. When the struggle is over, we shall wear the victor's crown in a new Uganda. So listen to this freestyle. Our people complain night and day. They wonder why they continue to live this way. But I know that things can change someday. If we really want them to change anyway. Africa is a land of abundance. But the Africans living in deficiency. The leaders want like presidents. So we must abandon that silly tendency. Africa rich but the Africans poor. Because the leaders they drunk on power. They run nations like like family affair, the citizens suffer, but we don't care. When the struggle is over, we shall wear the victor's crown. We shall wear the victor's crown. We shall wear the victor's crown. When the struggle is over, we shall wear the victor's crown. In a new And oh, just like that river I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change is going to come. Oh, yes, it is. It's been too hard living, but I'm afraid. I, I don't know what's up there be on the skies. It's been a long, oh, a long time coming, but I know a change is gonna come. Oh, yes, it is. He's all, let's all pull together. We're going to do it seven times. Harambe, seven times. All right, ready to go. Harambe, 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 Harambe.